So here's our, here are our learning intentions as we start. We're hoping that today, um, at the end of our time together, that we have, as a collective, a better understanding of collaboration and co-teaching. We're really, really focusing on the co-teaching. It's one of the pieces that Sharon was coding for in the research. It's one of the pillars of the project of how do we actually capitalize on that ex shared expertise in working together in the classroom with all kids. Um, we want to leave, of course, with a plan to increase the effectiveness of our collaboration. I think, we think, there's lots of examples of collaboration. Um, some have more impact on learning than others, and there's lots of, it's a bumpy road sometimes when we first start, and people don't want to waste their time. Um, and so we really want to look at how we can best use our time together, and to leave with an idea in our head, um, in our, for each of us, I guess, to, to think about what am I going to do a little bit differently to be more effective uh, w with a partner when I get there. And around that, we've stolen tons of examples from this project and across the province that uh, you'll get on a handout, and if we get a chance, we'll talk to some of them. Um, and finally, last year, we did a model of a class review um, as a way of starting, you know, we talk about no plan, no point, and so you have to find out who you, your kids are, what they know, their strengths, their areas of need, set some goals. Um, so we're going to come back and make a little reference to that to, as a reminder of what that can look like, because we think that that's one of the ways that uh, we can use as a planning tool when we get through to the end. Um, and in the last 10 minutes, um, we're going to have a guest, and Lisa is going to share with us um, an example of what she did in from a co-planning model um, with one of the classes and teachers that she was working with who was in the project last year. So, so as Faye's already mentioned, one of the parameters of this project was around collaboration and that doesn't matter with whom, right? It could be the Aboriginal support worker, the Aboriginal teacher, the teacher librarian as Faye referred to yesterday, the resource teacher working in the classroom with the teacher. So the whole premise of this morning is wrapped around that. So why? Why do we collaborate and co-teach? And, and this came from feedback last year from the point of view of people saying, okay, what's the benefit of doing this? So what Faye and I did was dig, looking for people's statements, but I'll be really honest with you. What we did was tie them to our beliefs. So this is very much based on the belief, our belief, because we happen to be the ones with the mic, based on the belief that collaborative planning, teaching and assessing better addresses the diverse needs of students by creating ongoing effective programming in the classroom. We've talked, and we talked a little bit about that last year, there's lots of effective different ways to address the needs of kids, but one of the pieces that we looked at in this project when it first began was how can we better meet the needs through collaborative work in the classroom. So not looking at how can we get better at a piece where somebody might be out of the classroom getting intensive work, because we, we're, we're pretty good at a lot of that. But how can we get better at that ongoing work so that when those kids, if they are out, return to the classroom, return to a place where their needs are being better met all day long. And so that wraps into, and this comes from personal experience, learning that by doing this, I felt better because it allowed more students to be, needs to be reached. The classroom teacher felt better because together we knew that. We could see it in the work that we were doing. Because instead of four kids being referred down the hall, we were working around all the kids in the classroom. Okay. And maybe kid five and six, who you would like to have had in that group, yes. but there wasn't quite enough room. So it's just looking at that. It's taking away the piece that says only these kids are getting a service to saying all of the kids are, and we intensify and diversify the service based on the needs of the kids. So obviously it focuses on the ongoing context for learning because that context is in the classroom. So we're not just focusing on the specific remediation of skills remo removed from the learning context of that classroom. And I don't imagine there isn't a person in the room who can't think of an example, particularly you've been one of those people, where you work with kids on something down the hall and they don't transition that or generalize that back to the classroom situation. And we know that from research. People all over the place have done research around that we can teach it in an isolated context and particularly kids with learning difficulties do not generalize that information to another context. So if we do it in the context, we give them a better chance. 
And our belief is that even if we did work with, some, with a group of kids outside the classroom on a particular group of skills, um, the be if that happens, then we also need to take ourselves with the kids into the classroom so that we can do that bridging, help them with the bridging as it comes on. Um, so, you know, I think about the, you know, one of the, we talked last year about um, of all the programs that there's a research base on about what makes a difference or the programming, um, the only one that came up that had solid research behind it was reading recovery. Um, and the work that has gone on in reading recovery is exemplary. Okay? But when I go back to, the, in my thinking about the original, when Marie Clay originally started, she had her reading recovery teachers often moved through. So they worked with reading recovery um, and kids one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. and then they worked in the classroom so that the kids in the class, they returned after several years to the classroom, so the kids in the, all the kids in the classroom benefited from that range of skills. And so that's a piece, you know, we've got, we unfortunately we don't have very many reading recovery teachers anymore because they've been cut in so many districts, but they're hugely skilled. And so it's that piece of how do we take those skills and the knowledge that they have about supporting learners, and how do we help more of us in the classroom know that piece as well? And I've just made a decision that I think the example with Marsha fits better with the next point. Okay. So this point around, it builds a repertoire of strategies for teachers to support the range of students in their classes. This is going to be an example I use later, but it just twigged in my head that I'm stealing this example from Arrow Lakes. I'm stealing this example from Marsha um, because I had the opportunity to facilitate last year in Arrow Lakes. And one of the neatest things that happened was that the support teacher asked Marsha if she could go into her classroom and teach in that classroom so that Marsha could have the opportunity to observe the students in her classroom. Because as a classroom teacher, I'm busy teaching. Just having the opportunity to watch my kids, to see how they interact differently with a different teacher. And in particular, in Marsha's case, it gave her the opportunity to see a teacher who used different strategies, who used different techniques, to see how those could also mesh with the way that she could work with those kids. And what Marcia spoke absolutely passionately about in the meeting in the cusp was, and I got to really watch my focus student as part of changing results for young readers. And I saw that focus student respond differently to Karen than to me. And so, after the opportunity for Karen to teach, in the classroom where Marsha was the classroom teacher. Then they sat down and talked about ways that they could support together. So a completely different model than I'm typically familiar with. They didn't plan first, they planned after. The best part about it was the repertoire of strategies for both that changed. Did she get to speak? Thank no, I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I checked that part earlier. Oh, I thought she. <laughs> but was I thought speaking. she might. After I, I, I don't know. Did I extrapolate speaking. too much, Marcia? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for her voice. I told her I might lie a little bit when I told that, but I didn't know whether I had or not. Okay. So, let me just see if there's anything else in here that we need to read. Just oh, that yeah, last just, point. Just the consistency. We've talked about that, Randy, because we don't want to run out of time. Okay. So the belief is, if we share our collective knowledge about all of the students and learning, we'll end up with a plan of action, and based on this, we can better address the learning needs. And so it's the rationale all the time. Two of us working together with the experiences and the expertise that we bring are better than any one of us working alone. Okay? Um, and so it's that piece, and it doesn't matter and who the two are. And it's way more fun. Absolutely. Well, especially if you like the person. But <laughs> well, just keep checking. And even if you probably. don't, you can grow to like them. <laughs> okay, I'll be working on that. <laughs> but it's that piece that says, you know, when when I come into a classroom, I come in with a certain set of expertise, you know, a, a certain set of skills. Actually, when I come into the classroom, I like to think I come with a fair amount of skills because I've been doing this for such a long time, um, and. And you learn as you're going, right? But I also know that when I come into a classroom and work with a teacher, it doesn't matter if the teacher is even in their first or second year of experience. In all the classes I've been in co-teaching, I have never been in a classroom where I haven't learned something. 
and I come in like Methuselah. I mean, really. These, you know, so these, you know, some of them are like 23, 24, and I can tell when I arrive that, you know, they're sometimes feeling a bit intimidated. I'm saying like, don't, so don't worry about this because we're just going to have a good time. It'll be good for the kids, and we'll, yeah, but you know, we've got a plan. We'll see what happens at the end. Never, and it's not a word of it, a lie. Never have I been in a classroom where something didn't happen that that other teacher did where I've thought, you've got to be kidding. I've been teaching this long, and I've never thought of that. Now that was brilliant. Okay? But you know what happens is, as the person who's there all the time, you don't know necessarily always the little sparks of brilliance because you're so busy doing the work that you don't have that outside set of eyes to say, do you know when you did that, here's what happened to John. Oh. And when you did that, here's what happened with this little group. So it's that piece of being able to go back and forth and remembering that, that just it's, it is better together if you both have a voice in what's going on. And Faye, think about what happens to the culture of a school when that happens. Because now two people have worked together. And I might be the resource teacher in that situation, and I might steal that brilliant thing you did as a classroom teacher and share it with someone over here. And so the professional development that happens in a building as a result of just one situation like that is huge. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of community. Yes. So we own all of the kids instead of thinking, oh, I'm so glad I didn't have that class this year. Uh-huh. You know? Oh, you know, I've missed them. You know, they're, or they're coming through, this is a good year to be pregnant. Well, not yes. but, you know, just Because it happens, right? Instead of all being together. Or a good year to transfer. Right? Or to transfer, yes. Okay. So obviously last year, this whole project was framed around collaboration, right? One of the best things about this project was teachers having the opportunity to share ideas and practices with each other. So we have a task for you to start off with. I think it's coming up shortly, is it? Yes. Yes. Two minutes. So share with one person at your table the best collaborative experience you had in changing results for Young Readers Project last year. And if you weren't part of the project, Listen for the themes you hear people talk about. So resurface that best thing from last year. Now we recall last year when we began that this was one of the pieces that was really challenging. It was to, to figure out we had um, teachers and we had schools who said, you know, we're not really necessarily going to, we don't want to play by those rules. Um, and so we'll come, but we're not actually interested in that collaborative piece. Um, or we'll only come if we can have extra time for the collaboration because we're still going to do the stuff that we did before. Um, because for many of us, this is, this is new and it's, um, it sometimes is bumpy when we get started. And so we're always looking for that piece because we so firmly believe in strength-based to think about, so what did you find that worked well? And what would happen if you did more of that more often? And how can you build that repertoire? How can you c continue to grow if you, if you really do believe that t collectively we know more? Okay? And Randy and I do. And if collectively you believe that we actually know enough to teach each and every child in this province how to read, and we do, then we need to keep working to go and say, so what else do we need to do to make that difference? So, you know, uh, the most interesting thing that stood out to me in listening in the groups that I listened to was the adults talking about how they felt included. Mm -hmm. That by working together, I felt included. I, I was so impressed with the way the person felt included in the staff because she. So the conversation even wasn't, that I heard wasn't about kids. It was about us and how lonely this profession can be. And when we work with others, we feel part of of it. So the shift is we have worked long and hard and well at a model that was about fixing kids. Okay? Could you please, and I heard this not just in, in groups that I was working with, but I heard this in many places around the province um, last year where people would say, I don't know why when they come back from wherever they've been, you know, and you can fill it in, they're not better, mm -hmm. you know? She only has a small group to work with, or she only has two or three kids. Why aren't they better when they come back? Um, because it's a fixing model that we're thinking about. Uh, and, and you and I were originally trained in a deficit model thing. Yes. We were very we never much got trained good at it, that's why we had to yes. change. <laughs> I mean, that was the well, mentality we're given, right? <laughs> 
And so the shift that happened years ago was to a more of an inclusive model, right? That inclusive model became more of a strengths-based model. It, we looked instead at fixing what we were doing instead of fixing the kid within the classroom or within the curriculum. But there were still some aspects with that. Next slide. Okay. We still went within that inclusive model. So what we see is that transformations have happened even within the inclusive model that we've been involved in. Okay, we've gone from very much of a pull out or you're physically included in the class but you might as well be sitting in a cardboard box at the back, right? It was still very much a remedial model. We still worked on making kids fit within that but they were often on a very different plan. And there's nothing wrong with having a different plan. We have kids that we work with that need different plans, but sometimes we slip into that different plan mode before we look at how they can be part of. And so where I see things are moving, and, and I think that's one of the tenets of what we're working on here, is an inclusive model where we see classroom teachers as the central support focus, the key in what we're doing. And then... So all of us who are non-enrolling, our job is to line up beside the classroom teacher and figure out how best to support that student. Okay? But the, the voice of the classroom teacher is very, very critical. So at the beginning of the year, and I'm sure I'll see this in some of the places that I am in September, what does not happen is the resource teacher or the learning assistance teacher, or I'd also include the um, English language learner teacher, does not say to the classroom teacher, here's the list of kids I'm going to see this year. Okay. That that comes if what you're looking at in terms of who the targeted kids are arises from a conversation, a planned conversation around some kind of structure where the classroom teacher and the support person sit down and say, let's talk about this class and the needs and the strengths in this class. And let's make a plan. So no one person, as a classroom teacher, I'm not saying, here's, my, here's the group, take them. No. One group last year said to me, I, have 11 I was sent 11 kids to do spelling. I thought, boy, that's not a very busy um, resource room. If A, you can, first of all, 11 kids sounds to me like a classroom program, but spelling, like that's the biggest issue, um, is spelling. <laughs> that's good staffing in the building, good staffing, because, you know, a lot of us don't get to that part um, for a long, long time, because there's other needs that pop up. But, but it's that piece of saying, you have to work together around what's the part in here that's important. Okay? We're, we're on a project about reading. We believe that reading is about making sense, learning to read and reading to learn together and enjoying reading and wanting to read. And we want that for all our kids, so that ought to be coming up in a collaboration somehow. Okay? How are we working together to get better at this piece? So the kinds, some of the things that we think of that make a difference when we're together in this classroom fall into this list. Now, what I want you to do after you've heard them is take another one of those two minutes and say, so what are two in there that jump out to you? Okay, what are two that jump out you think, you know, that's something that I think might make a difference in my class. Okay, here's the list. Work from a plan based on students' strengths and needs. Differentiate instruction. Use AFL strategies to assess understanding. Increase participation of all students. Decrease behavioral challenges. Focus attention. Increase student independence. Teach self-regulation. Model positive, strength-based language. Talk to each other about what they're learning about their students. Okay. In your role, what jumps out at you from there that would be beneficial when you're working with somebody else in the classroom? Two minutes. <laughs> when I'm thinking about those focus areas, here's one of the things that I think about. And I'm sure this has happened, and this may be part of the conversation that you had at your table. There are times when the most important need in the classroom is management. 
that learning can't happen for anybody, whether it's somebody who's vulnerable or somebody who's not vulnerable, until some patterns and routines get established, and it's taking more than one person to do that. You okay? better believe it. <sighs> and so that's the starting point, right? So it's not just, you know, yes, our big, our focus, our end goal is reading, but we may, that may not be our first step, because if we can't get the kids to the carpet um, to listen to a story, or when they get to the carpet, it's not a safe place to be, then that's where we need to start. And so we need to be thinking about that. How do we make this environment work? Because until we get the environment and the culture going, and sometimes it's simultaneously with the, with the reading activities that we're doing, but we have to get that all together in order to get started. And so sometimes that's the place where we're first beginning. Rather than starting with, the, I've already identified the skills in my groups, and so here's where we're going to start. We, we get, you need some of those structures that come in there. So when we start to work, and we're working together, we, need, we have to keep a framework of questions in our head to make sure that what we're doing is, what we, is really getting us the, what it is that we're aiming for, what, what that whole um, impact is. And so we consider these kinds of questions. Are all students actively engaged in meaningful work? If there are two of us there, there's a greater chance of us being able to say yes or to tweak it, whatever we're doing, to make the engagement. Remember Sharon kept saying that yesterday? It's the most important thing. If you're not engaged, you can't be learning. And let's be engaged with something that counts. Okay? Because so, sometimes they're actually, yes, really engaged, but they're engaged with activities that don't particularly count. You know, the sheets? You know, sometimes sheets are handed out because they're really good for management, but they're not all that good for meaning making. Um, and so you want to have both those pieces. That's the goal. Are they engaged, everybody, in meaningful work? Are all students participating by answering and asking questions? So here's my example around that. A long time ago in a building that Sue used to work in way over here on the far side of the room, the role I took on as resource teacher in a grade 6-7 classroom was moving around the room, cueing kids about the questions that Ellen, the classroom teacher, was going to ask, and cueing them around, what do you think you could say when she asked this question? Because one of the goals we had for five of the kids in that classroom, participation, engagement, offering their knowledge, because they never shared. And it took six weeks of me doing that before these kids started spontaneously do that. And then our plan changed. And that wasn't the role I had anymore. Okay. Are all students receiving individual feedback during the le learning sequence? Again, you know, what came up yesterday? That one-on-one -on -one support. Okay? So when something's happening in the classroom, if there's two of us there, then we've actually cut our class size down uh -huh. to 11 or 12 kids. And now, we ought to be able to even more easily get around to make sure that we're coming in with those feedback questions to each and every one of the kids, okay? What's working so far in what you're doing? Is there something in here that's challenging? What can I do to help? So we're looking at shifting that ownership, but there's that piece to get the feedback. So again, if we think about it in the context of changing results, it's not just the one focused student that we're thinking about, but we're thinking about that whole range. The student who's exceeding expectations. You know, some of those kids that were, that were on Maureen's data slide when they first came in also need some feedback in that learning sequence to propel the learning forward. And so we can individualize as as we're going around much better because it's a goal. You need the individual piece rather than just the group piece if the group's going to work well for you. And Faye, I think one of the benefits that happens from that co-teaching example here is that from Faye and I working together, obviously at the end of this session, not the end of the session, at the end of today, we'll talk about, so what did we learn from today that would make tomorrow better? That can be a three-minute conversation at the end of that time that we work together that sets us up for tomorrow. Because what did we learn from the kids? What did we learn from working together that worked or didn't work that we're going to shift? We put this one separately because it's, it's another one of those overarching questions is that we want to keep coming back. We're never, we want to make sure that we don't think about any one Focus is always the best 
all the time. And so you want to keep coming back to think, is what we're doing right now, this form of co-teaching that we're doing, is it the best for this time, for this task, for this student? Okay. Or for this group of students? Because there's different ways to co-teach. So it's not one size fits all, all the time, but looking about at what else could we do and saying together, so you know, you know, Randy said like we use this information to start to see what we're going to do tomorrow when we're together or in a few days when we're together. But the other piece we want to keep thinking about is that could we have been working together in a different way that would have been better? Okay? And one of the things that we're going to do in, in the next chunk is talk about what some of those ways of working together can look like. Um, but we, it's another piece that we think about is that is this best for now for these kids because it's the flexibility that makes a difference right if there's two of us there it's even more easy it's even easier to be flexible if we're in different places it's much more difficult to be flexible because you can't tell what the other guy's doing okay and it's more time to talk to keep ourselves working in a consistent direction for those kids so is it okay to walk around the class and support is needed is it okay to have those one-on-one -on -one conferences with kids is it okay to talk, take small groups out for phonemic awareness? Again, it goes back to, is this the most effective use of teacher time to support the mutually agreed upon goals of student learning? So look at those questions. Is it okay for one of the teachers to walk around the class and support kids as needed? Because this child needs help in focusing attention. Because this child needs help in answering a question because this child needs help in following and tracking and self-regulating? Is it the opportunity to cue kids around some of the things that Deb has shared with us? Is that an okay role? Is that an okay role all year? Is that an okay role for a short time? Those are the questions we need to be asking ourselves around what we do and how we do it. And those pr three particular questions were, were I put down because they were all questions that people asked me last yes. year. Uh, when we were talking about um, co-teaching, but can I, you know, could I still do this? Could I still do this? Um, and Sunday night we were, had the benefit of working with um, Bev Krieger around ways to deepen conversations um, in our collaborative groups when we were working together in the project. And and one of the things that I was thinking about is that sometimes we get questions and you think like, well, well I don't know what to do with that question. See, and I think it's a shift. It's not a, can I do this or can I do that? Is let's take it back to a question that gives more power to the people who are asking the question right. and shift it to the piece that says, you know, that's, that's a piece of the question, but the real question here is, is, is what, if we do this, is that getting us to the goals that we have that are going to focus on student learning? So it doesn't mean that you can't take a group out and work on, the, on phonemic awareness with them, if that is part of supporting getting toward the goals. Okay. And it is okay, you know, could it be okay to have one-on-one -on -one conferences while this is going on? Absolutely, Absolutely, if it's coming through the goals. So it's helping take those questions that we sometimes get and elevate them to the piece about why are we doing this? Let's put it into a different context. Okay. It's not okay if it's not focusing on improving student learning, if we're not seeing results from it, or if one of the adults is feeling undervalued. So if you're the resource person and you're in the place where you're walking around and you're supporting as needed and you come in with all your expertise and you hum around the room saying, can I help? Can I help? Can I help? You're there about three and a half nanoseconds before you're thinking, why am I here? I could do anything and have a greater impact on student learning. What a waste of my time. And so for me, that takes it back to the bigger question. If that's what I'm feeling, then I need to be asking the question, not of myself only, mm -hmm. of myself and whomever I'm working with, is this the most effective use of our time to support the mutually agreed upon goals that we have? And it might be for right now. I might have to feel that way for a while. If it's targeted, Randy, uh -huh. the way you it was when you it. talked about the, the five kids that you knew needed to, to learn how to 
participate in the classroom. And so your goal wasn't just to hover around and see if Barb would like a little help just now and Debbie would like a little help and yes. who's looking desperate. But you had definite kids that you were aiming toward to bridge them into the class. And you might also have noticed <clears throat> somebody else at the same time and you could have nudged them in. But you had a job to do. Like because, we because we talked who about who those five kids were. Okay. So, we have two questions for you. And you don't get that full luxurious two minutes you had last time. You only get 90 seconds this time. Here's your first question. When you think about the possibilities of co-teaching, what's your dream? What would be, yeah, maybe one minute. What's your dream? What would be the most marvelous way for this to play itself out for you? Think big. It's a dream. No yes buts. Okay? Only possibilities. One minute. What's your co-teaching dream? Randy and I both think that those questions are important questions to have with the people on our staff. Okay? So, and notice where we introduced the questions. We didn't start with them. We started by talking a little bit about what do we think co-teaching is? What do we think collaboration is? What do we think focusing on in-class support looks like? So we started with building a little bit of background knowledge and sharing some of our beliefs and some of the purposes behind it. And then we asked the questions. So I would be asking those questions if, if this is something that you're working with on your staff. Those are the kinds of questions that I'd ask with my staff. But I wouldn't ask them first. Because if you ask them before you've started to have any conversation about that shared understanding of what collaboration and in-class support looks like, then, then everybody is all over the map. Okay? So, <clears throat> but you need them out because you want to be able to deal with them. You know? So what do you think that, what would be really good in here? Okay? And what is it that you're really you know, afraid of? So one of the things I heard was, you know, what's my worst nightmare? Working with somebody who's not talking in language that's strength-based about kids. Well, like, no kidding, right? It's the shaming and blaming, and you're thinking, how am I ever going to do anything? But think about then what it's like to be a student in that classroom. Because, and you know, sometimes I think we don't even hear that language coming out. Oh, really? You know, it, it sounded like that. Um, think so, about but, the model I can provide by sharing, by sharing language. different language. Yeah. So. We look at this, you know, when we look at that whole support on co-teaching and collaboration, it's got lots of ties um, into RTI and, and where that piece comes through. And, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in October, but that's just sort of a little flash up there because we want to get to the stuff. Okay. So here's the stuff. Uh, possibilities of what it can look like. So I used this framework. Um, of different models, because it was, it was simple and clear. I sent it to Randy, he said, oh, that makes perfect sense. It's way better than the way we've been talking about it. It comes from a book called Teaching in Tandem. Okay? So I'm crediting the book, I'm crediting the models, but I'm also telling you not to bother buying the book, unless you really like to read stuff that you're going to be able to say, no, it would never do that, way too American. No, it would never way do that, it doesn't sound American. like my context. Okay. <laughs> but, she didn't so, tell me that before she sent me the slide. No, I sent him the slide. He said, it's brilliant. I said, it is. He said, I'll get the book. I said, I don't know that you really need the book. But because the context is very different. We live in a very different educational context. Um, this is written for, with a very political context in mind. It's not like ours. The, um, and very numbers driven context. But the, the models themselves we thought were quite lovely. So we would like to wander you through um, the models. We're going to talk about each one a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk about them in terms of what does this look like and then what are the strengths and some of the possible pitfalls of each one. Again with that piece of it's a repertoire to choose from when you think about how can I work with somebody else together. And just to cue, remember all of these PowerPoints go up on the website, so don't feel like you need to capture all these slides because there, there is some great stuff here. Um, but you may want to process it in your brain and think about it. So if you've already skimmed this one, you've probably already attached it to some of the conversations that have happened around being the extra pair of hands, right? Because this is the one that, that certainly that I see is the most frequently done, right? It takes the least amount of planning, but therefore it has the greatest pitfall. But the advantages are there's two of us in the room, so there's more one-to-one -one feedback. You know, if we alternate roles, no one has the advantage or looks like the real teacher. This is the one where you get kids saying, well, she's my teacher and she's my teacher and he's my teacher, 
which is wonderful because the kids see us all then as being their teachers. Can capitalize on each of our strengths and it builds professional capacity. So all those things happen out of this. The biggest pitfall is, is it's the easiest one to go off the rails because either one of us can feel like we're the extra pair of hands in the classroom, that we're just standing there twiddling our thumbs. So link that back to Faye's comment of, but if I know I have a direct responsibility when I'm in there of five students, six students that I'm helping to, it negates some of that. The other piece that makes a difference in this is that remember the part where Randy said at the end of the class, just one minute, two minutes, three minutes as you're walking out, how did it go today, what worked well, what could we change, is a way of making sure that this stays more goal directed and nobody feels useless. Yeah. And I think it's more common for the non-enrolling teacher to feel like the buzzing radiator than it is for the classroom yes. teacher. You know, really all this expertise and I'm wandering around saying how can I help. So two examples. First one, obviously, two teachers demonstrating a strategy, right? That we could use the next day. There are some examples of some strategies that we could be doing together, right? It, it may blend into some of the other models that we'll share from the point of view of what explicit roles are we taking while we're doing that. But it's a way for two people to do something. It could be kids are working independently on a task. One teacher's working the small group on that task, and the other teacher is supporting kids who are working independently. Again, one teacher might be moving around the room, helping kids who are working independently, knowing there's some specific students I need to particularly focus on, while another teacher, and notice our language. We're not saying the classroom teacher is doing one thing, and the resource teacher or teacher librarian is doing something else. That's a decision we make from the point of view of what works best for the kids. Now this can happen when one teacher is explaining something, giving instructions, the other teacher might be making a web of what those instructions look like. Okay? Might be saying after, so Randy's explained something and then I can say, so I understand I'm first going to do, and then going to do, and then going to do. Okay, check with your partner to see if that's what you understand too. So they're getting that piece that I might not know all the content that Randy's doing as the classroom teacher um, that comes in. I may not know exactly where they are as they're progressing through if they are actually doing um, some research around different kinds of whales or whatever the piece is. But I can take his fr talk from the front and if, rather than listening to him explain, I need to be showing kids how I'm making sense of his explanation because there's always kids who haven't figured out that they should be listening when the instructions are going on. Right? That doesn't go away in grade one and grade two, that lasts for a long time. They haven't figured out how to tie in, so then they have less learning time when everybody else gets to work. So even if it seems like a small role, I'm thinking about who are the kids that I know are going to need some support, and I could be going and saying, did you get it? Did you get it? Or I could be saying, here's what I'm understanding. And just doing a quick capsule of what he's done in a different kind of demonstration to show everybody. Because I think that gets a much wider group as we go through. The other thing it does is it says to the teacher, I could try that next time. Uh -huh. Right? It's like going to Pro-D without having to leave your classroom. There's something that I hadn't thought of doing okay? as you're going through each time. So, but it's making sure that that's happening all the time. Right? I need a job when I'm in there. The second model that they talk about, they call parallel groups. Now, when you're doing this, you divide the class in half or sort of half, you know, sometimes it's a little bit different, but you're not looking at a small group and a large group. You divide into two groups. The teacher takes one group, the non-enrolling teacher takes the other group. Okay? This takes more planning. Okay? It also takes, here's a big word, more trust. Okay? Because you have to assume that the other person is doing stuff the way you'd like it to be done. So you have to assume they know their content, they know their strategies, they know their process. So it means letting go of control. A little bit, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Now, what it gives you is way more personal contact, right? Way more personal contact. I've now got 10 kids. And don't I get to know them better than I do when I've got 20 kids? 
as I'm going. But it means that in order to do this, we need to have spent more time in planning. Because when you're finished working with your parallel groups, you don't want to come back and find out that Randy actually had a little extra time, so he did three more pages, right? And then you're thinking, oh good, now tomorrow I'm by myself, I've got half my kids who've done this much of the story and half my kids who've done this much, and I've got to think of a way to catch them up. So, you know, it takes much more pre-planning and thought um, to go through in that piece, but it has the advantage of being able to reach more kids as you're going through in the piece. So here's an example of what the parallel groups can work can look like. Uh, one of the schools in um, my Richmond group last year was Woodward Elementary, and when they were in our one of our initial meetings, it's a nice little tiny school. Um, in a, one of our initial meetings, they said, you know, what we really need is to focus more on word work with our kids. But that it's just it's, it seems to just be a gap in what we've been doing as a whole staff. There's other things we're really proud with, but we think this is a real need. So they got together with the whole team, and they involved everybody in primary in it. So this was way bigger than the people who were in the changing results group, and the principal, and the resource teacher, and they divided the kids up in groups, and they did word work three times a week in the gym with everybody there together, okay? And everybody had a group, okay? That's a form of parallel group, and it was bigger than just two, Okay, principal, just, she could hardly stand it. She was so excited. This is the best part of my week. Um, and the teachers, one of the teachers said one day, and she's having way more fun than all the rest of us um, in her group. Um, and the kids are wanting to all be in her group because there's a lot of giggling and laughing going on. But you see, what it did was it not only gave the kids more intensive instruction on something that was an identified need in the school, it involved more people and they talked to each other about what they were doing. So they'd be saying, now why were they laughing the other day? What did you do that they were all laughing? And they're all so busy in your group all the time. And so she'd be saying, well, I tried this and I tried that. Everybody's making little notes. I'm going to try that too. And what did you do? Because I noticed that stuff was going on over there. So that collaboration was just going round and round like that. And it was only three short periods of time, three times a week that they were doing it as a group and throughout the whole small primary department. Those were parallel groups. So another adaptation on parallel groups, and this one comes from Westwood Elementary in Coquitlam, where I had the opportunity to work with them for five years on an action research project. So primary team of teachers highly concerned about what can we do to better meet the needs of all the kids in our classroom. So as a group, they came up with the action research question around how do we better meet the needs of our students. Out of that group conversation came this type of parallel idea. So they used the standard reading assessment, which I always describe as a precursor to the DART. Would that be an accurate way to do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, they used that, listened to the kids read, highlighted on the performance standards. Then they met as a group. They used the language from the performance standards to form their groups. You can see some of their groups, text features, oral comprehension, risk taking, critical thinking with words, getting the big picture. They cross graded the kids one, two, two, three, four, into groups. There are everybody in the school, the ESL teacher, the resource teacher, the principal, all the classroom teachers. So we had four classrooms. We ended up with eight teachers. Obviously, smaller number of kids. They started two times a week doing this for six week blocks, then they would reassess. The kids would be shifted again into new groups. They did it again for six weeks. We surveyed the kids, we surveyed the teachers overwhelmingly. People talked about feeling better, working together. It was the conversation around the table. They brainstormed strategies they could use for those areas, so they shared that knowledge. They had very deep conversations that this was not paper and pencil time. This was teaching oral languaging time. It wasn't a time just to have a smaller group and give paper and pencil for the kids to do. It was a time to teach because you had fewer kids. The, the change in the culture of this school, in my opinion, was absolutely phenomenal because they collaborated together around a common need that they had at primary. And one of the best things that happened was the intermediate people said, we want to have an action research project too. 
At the end of four years, the whole school was involved. Station teaching. So in station teaching, it's looking at small groups within the classroom. It can be sort of a learning centers piece. It can be learning stations that are set up. It can also be small group guided reading that's set up. So in it, the difference in the station teaching compared to the parallel groups is smaller groups um, of kids who are working together, some of whom can be working independently. So um, often this is um, a homogeneous group where the kids are grouped together for a, a like skill and there's three or four or five kids that are together. Typically a teacher would have two groups, so you'd have two teachers in there, each teacher would have two groups, one that they are responsible for the independent work that they're working on and the other group that they are directly instructing and then they'd flip back and forth. So again, an advantage I get more individual attention again because not only are the kids having a chance to do some independent work and practice the skills that you've been teaching them, but you've got your group size down smaller and you can monitor what's going on back and forth. Um, so there's a greater focus on self-regulation, there's a greater focus on do you know your job, do you know what it is you're going to do, how's it working for you, how can you be independent from me within that sort of little bit of letting you out. Now here's a pitfall. Um, the possible pitfall, well, possible pitfall, here's a piece the way you, when you start, you can't start until you've taught the kids the self-regulation skills, okay? So you can't set up all your stations, you can't set up your learning centers, you can't set up all your different groups and then assign the kids <laughs> to go to them if you haven't taught them the prerequisite social skills of how to work without you sitting beside them for a certain amount of time. So when you're starting with your stations, you might be introducing one station to the whole class and everybody's learning how to do this and what their job is and how to work there and then another station comes along. So you don't start this approach on the second week of September because you're teaching the kids the prerequisite skills so that this can work well when it gets going and with two people. Okay? So it requires lots of self-regulation from those kids, but it gives them more teaching time, which is the piece that makes the difference. Yeah. So I talked about that first one already, and you guys know how to do that part. But that's an example of what the co-teaching can look like, right? The resource teacher, the non-enrolling teacher has two groups in guided reading, the classroom teacher has two groups, um, and you're going back and forth. The second one, um, was in when I was at Tate in Michelle's room uh, working with Michelle she's working on math groups um, she's working on math with her kids and she's got groups in her classroom that she's working with and in this particular case she had her kids in four groups what and here's how her piece I came in as a resource teacher so I'm very much coming in in the support role um, because she's got this unit that she's working on and she has a particular job for me when I come in she has one group that she's directly teaching okay she has two groups working on guided practice they're all working around patterning Okay. She has two groups working on, on guided practice. Her third group, she's working on guided practice, but she would like some feedback on how this group is working. And so my job is to be with this group, observe them, ask them some questions about how things are going, but not to interfere with the actual teaching, and then to report back so she can see if she needs to do some adjustment. Okay. So I'm there for a short period of time. I have a very specific task. I can observe easily and do a little bit of monitoring with the other two who are working on their guided practice piece, but they're very engaged. They really don't need me. I have so much information about the four kids that are working in this one group um, by being there for half an hour with them that I've talked about them for days. Okay. Oh, and they did this, and they did this, and here was the evidence of the thinking, and here's the evidence of the language, and here's what they could do with the actual symbolic representation, and um, which she couldn't possibly have done by herself, no matter how independent all three groups were, because I had nothing to do but to pay attention to those four kids. So she had a whole whack of information when that was over. And so after four visits to the class, we had detailed, super detailed information to use in the teaching and furthering of learning with all those kids in the math group. 
Now, I didn't know that this example fit within the station model when I did it because this example came out of a class review and the reason I've chosen it is because it's science. So the classroom teacher and I had done a class review. His key areas that he wanted to focus on were organizational skills, independence, self-monitoring, greater independence of his students and those sorts of things. And here was my bind. I couldn't work with him during the English language arts and math time because it didn't fit with all the other things that we were doing. So jointly we decided to work on this in science. Now this stretched me phenomenally. This goes to what I was talking about with the North Van people. He had the science curricular knowledge. I knew nothing about that area. Nothing. But I had the instructional knowledge. I had the strategic knowledge. I had the knowledge of helping kids to focus and do those sorts of things. So somehow he talked me into creating two science stations and he created two. I still to this day don't know how he did that because I should have adamantly refused. He should have created all four of them. What we did in our co-planning was... To, sorry. Not equitable. I know that's not equitable, well, I know, but given my knowledge of science, it would have been a lot easier. Um, what we did in our co-planning was talk about how we could ensure that the stations met the needs of all the kids, how they were differentiated, how we would train the kids, how we'd work with them, those sorts of things. So that was the whole setup in advance. When we got to the point of actually opening all four science stations, it was an absolute joy to watch. It's one of the best times I remember as a resource teacher working in this classroom while the kids were actively engaged in these science stations and I learned tons about science from having to explore those stations with the kids. And the kid I remember in particular was the kid who refused to do anything. Who, Because it was a station approach in science which was one of his passions and love, you wouldn't have noticed him from anybody else in the classroom. One large group, one small group. I don't think there's anything here that, uh, you know, either, teach, either teacher can work with either group. We've referenced these all morning from the point of view of, again, it doesn't matter whom, whom? Anyway, it doesn't matter which person is doing which. Um, because it's that opportunity to provide tutorial, intensive, individual, small group support. Obviously, the big pitfall here is the Blackbird group, right? The, gr this, the same kids being in the group that works with A. And so this goes back to my example from Westwood, that if we're continually looking at the kids, then the kids who might be in the small group will change based on the focus of the small group. So here's some way of changing that back table group. Okay. One teacher's working with the whole class in writing. Um, they're introducing, they're drafting, the kids are working. And one teacher meets with a group of three or four kids to do some conferencing and some editing together. Not just one-on-one, -on -one, but as a little group so that they're learning how to also do the peer editing and peer conferencing with one another. And the group changes. Okay? So here comes a group, here comes another group, and they're moving through. Okay? Same thing in reading. Everybody's reading, large group. The teacher is moving from student to student, listening to short oral reads. Okay? Because after, you know, they've all got their, their books they're reading, they can be reading their just right books, it can be choice time and they're reading their choice books, but you're going around and you're just listening to a sentence or two from each child because that's a chance to get that individual feedback. And two or three students are sitting with a particular teacher around a particular focus. Okay? So one's moving around and the other's got a very small group with something that they're working on. So it could be because this is a time where they need, it could be the kids who are the least developed readers and that could be the group that you're working with one of the days, but if that's the group you work with every single day you're in the class, you're gonna be targeted as, in comes Faye and she takes the kids who have trouble, okay, rather than being a co-teacher. So some kids will say to the resource person, how come you're talking to me? Right? Because they have you, so it really is still segregation. You've just moved your body inside the classroom. So it has to be that piece about, about working with all of us together. The small group is working on reading th Reader's Theatre is an example I just wanted to reference because again, I stole it from Arrow Lakes and shared it with another group as part of changing results for young readers from the point of view of a way to work together from the point of view that engages kids 
effectively in what they're doing. And the conversation that happened subsequent to that was rich from the point of view of how are we helping kids to have the opportunity to practice reading. The math example is because it pushes again, right? It takes us outside the classroom into the environment. And it's a really neat way. So here's a large group of kids who are using manipulatives to represent shapes. Small groups are rotating with another teacher using iPads to take pictures of shapes in the environment. Kids love being outside. And then the one that I think we're sort of working toward is the teaming one. It's the one where it's seamless, okay? The, it's absolutely co-planned. It's easiest, it's often easiest when you've worked with somebody for a while. The teachers take alternate roles. It's kind of like Aunt Randy and I are, are trying to do today. We've planned this together. It doesn't matter really, in most cases, who takes what slide and who starts, although there's particular pieces in there that we each know about. And that's what it looks like again in the classroom. Okay. It's most often, I think, in this kind of seamless piece happening when you've got everybody together, when you've got that whole class um, and one's taking the lead and you're alternating that back and forth as you're going on. It often starts that seamless piece in whole class and it's followed up in smaller group work with one of the other models. Okay. It requires lots of trust. Okay. And it requires lots of planning. Okay. And when it works, it's absolutely seamless. And you can't imagine what you ever did when you didn't have that person around to work with some of the time. But it's constantly building each others skills as teachers okay it's the piece where I think of at one point when I was working we had a particularly challenging class and and um, I just and I worked in the class with the teacher every Thursday when I was there until um, recess and I just at recess would come the first couple of months and I think I just I don't know how she survives and I said to Ruth like I just you know like I don't know how you're doing this and she says well I only hang on until Thursday and on Thursday you come and you're here till recess and I think I haven't lost my mind yet. I can make it through till Friday. Okay, that's all she said. That's all. Because we're supposed to be experienced, we're supposed to know what we were doing. We were that we were in the stage where we couldn't even, you know, it was Thanksgiving. We were still hanging on to the are they all on the carpet? Could we do something? You know, is it safe in here for everybody? The learning needs were way down on the, all the other stuff. And we were supposed to know what we were doing. And and I'd say to her, like, really? You and you come back again every day and she said, I just hang on for Thursday. Hang on for Thursday. But it's that piece of, you know, how do you actually work in that place where it changes the learning for everybody, it, starting with whatever it is that needs to happen so that learning is better for those kids from 9 to 3. Okay? We can all be super effective for 20 minutes or 30 minutes with a small group. But those kids who are most at risk need ongoing fabulous learning opportunities that they can be engaged in all day if they're going to keep pace with their companions. Okay? Okay. So here's what I'd like you to do. One minute. Say something to the person beside you. What's ringing in your head from those examples as you've gone? What's ringing in your head? So the class review process. Okay? You've seen this before. We're just going to very quickly refer to it. You start the conversation with what are the strengths of this class? and you follow up that with what are the needs of this class and then what are your goals for this year and then who are the individuals and we meet as often as as we can to do this process at the beginning of the year with the school based team including the administrator and classroom teachers come in it takes 45 minutes to, um, to have the conversation come up with a plan as we're starting at the beginning the hardest question in that group of four for many people when they come in um, you know, third week or fourth week of September, what are the strengths of your class? And you've got to stick with it. You can't say, oh, well, they're not a bad group. But here are the needs, okay? Because if it's going to be strengths-based, you have to keep talking about what makes this class work so that you're changing the vision that says there are strengths. Not they're driving me crazy, there are strengths, okay? Read, they're all talking all the time. Okay, so they're verbal. Okay? But that's the piece. Is that, now, so that really is the place it? where you're going to talk. Okay. We typically record on this form, okay? just because we find that the graphic helps with the organizing as we go through. 
Um, and here's an example, which is not easy to see, but will be on the website. But the most important piece about that is we just wanted you to have a look to see how that can look as you go through. Notice that we don't have decisions yet because we're going to make decisions um, after, if we're doing this as a school, after all the classroom teachers have come together and we've assigned support okay, as a team. So that support isn't the same for every classroom. Support is based on the needs of the class in comparison to the other needs of the classes in the school because we're a community and we're all in this together. And then the support person and the classroom teacher have some time, probably another 45 minute period, to sit together to start to make some co-planning about the decisions that are gonna be made. Now, if you've never seen class reviews before, there is an absolutely unbelievable chapter in Learning in Safe Schools that walks through how to take part in class reviews. It's the basis upon which the science example came from because the goals of the teacher were. <laughs>